Over the summer, on the heels of a pandemic, we saw a glimpse of the black community's collective power as we, and our ability to promote change, as we united behind the Black Lives Matter movement. Across this nation, people took action following the violent police and vigilante deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. Even folk who had never participated in actions before found a way to lend their voice for the call for justice and changing towards solutions. In these moments, I was proud and inspired by the showing of collective works by the entire black community, nonprofits, faith, and organizations alike. But in these moments, I was also saddened by our collective silence and our immobility on behalf of black trans people. How many of you know that over the summer, we also mourned the deaths of Tony McDade, a black trans man killed by police in Tallahassee, Florida. Oriah Milton and Brian Powers from right here in Ohio. Or Dominique Fells, found severed in Philadelphia. And 17-year-old Brayla Stone, killed in Arkansas. These are just five of what we know to be 31 murders of trans and gender nonconforming people this year. A growing epidemic of violence and murder in the trans community, particularly against black trans women, whose average life expectancy in this country is 35 years old, compared to 72 for black men and 78 for black women. Shouldn't we know and act collectively on behalf of these causes as we united behind the causes for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor? Yet, largely, these stories go unreported or misreported by the media, despite the fact that they face extraordinary levels of sexual and physical violence, rather they be on the streets, at home, at school, or at the hands of our government officials. In fact, researchers say that black trans women are seven times more likely to experience physical violence when interacting with police than cisgendered victims and survivors, or victims and survivors whose gender identity matches their assigned sex at birth. I attribute our community's silence to heteronormative views and values that are held within the black community. Ideas that heterosexuality predicated on gender binary or male and female, are somehow the social and cultural norm and superior to black LGBTQ identities and sexualities. This often leads to our contentment to address issues around race, elevating the stories of black men, but often forgetting the issues around sex, gender, and sexuality, forgetting intersectionality, a term coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, which describes how race, class, and gender, and other characteristics intersect and overlap with one another. Over the summer, as one of the only nonprofits for and by black LGBTQ people, Black Out and Proud was caught at the intersection of our identities and our oppressions. And we watched as our cisgendered black counterparts organized protests in the name of social justice, but often in the absence of queerness. And we watched as our white queer counterparts planned pride events in the name of civil liberties, but often in the absence of race. So we organized our I Am campaign as a way to recognize and affirm all black intersectional identities amplifying this important point, that blackness is not a monolith. And we scheduled a multi-communal action, marching with pride. And we scheduled it on Juneteenth as a way to commemorate our ancestors' plight in this country as we raised our voices for justice, equity, and liberation for all black people. 
And we ask the community to stand with us, not only against police brutality and structural racism, but homophobia and transphobia and solidarity. And although we did not set out to op compare oppressions, certainly some of the marketing for this campaign was controversial. And some of our peers, black people with heteronormative views, said that our, move, our motions were a distraction to the movement. But I would offer that although some of the largest protests in the Black Lives Matter movement have been fueled by the violence against black men, the founders of this movement have always been queer anti-racist. They've always worked to include the needs of the black LGBTQ community in the movement. And I would also offer that if we are to do movement work on behalf of all black people, we have to move from being anti-racist to queer anti-racist. Anti-racist is described as actions that are taken to dismantle structures that perpetuate racism. Queer anti-racism intersects identity and sexuality with race. And it acts us, it motivates us, it should, to take actions that simultaneously disrupt and dismantle all forms of depression, all forms of oppression. Audre Lorde once said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And to the degree that our identity as black is multidimensional, so too is movement work. So rather it be Black Lives Matter, or Me Too, or the LGBTQ rights movement, our movements are not mutually exclusive. They are interdependent, as our principal struggle is our oppression. And we should be united behind the fact that we are all human beings, deserving, equally deserving, of the benefits of this society. My theory of change is simple. And it involves the belief that service is the vehicle to change. Much like the principal Ujima, the servant leadership philosophy emphasizes the accountability to others and places their highest need over our own self-interest, making their problems our own. And as we've seen over the summer and continue to see in this movement, there is power in our collective action. And there is power in our actions, and our actions can change lives for the better, leave them unchanged, or regrettably leave them unchanged. Which will it be? Assuming that you chose the former, change lives for the better. Here are some ways that we can be in service to all black people in this movement. Acknowledge the social, economic, and legal privileges that come with being cisgendered and heterosexual in society, knowing that your civil liberties will never be overturned because someone disagrees with your identity or your sexuality. And use that privilege, however you see fit, to stand up for the civil liberties of black LGBTQ people. Honor queer identities, trans and gender nonconforming alike, and deepen your understanding of what it means to have their lived experience. When I was growing up, my aunt had a best friend, Brandy. Brandy was one of the most grandiose black women I knew. She always had on the most amazing couture. She had a nurturing, loving personality and a signature scent that lingered in any room long after she had sassed away. Brandy died when I was in college, and her family at the funeral had her in a suit and tie. And what's worse, her life story was not in her obituary, and the name on the front of her obituary was one she had long left behind. The truth is, Brandy was not a man. She was not a gay man pretending to be a woman in plain dress up. She was a black trans woman. And I often wonder what her story and her legacy would be if we honored her identity. The truth is that back then we didn't have the language, the knowledge, or the courage, but we do now. For nonprofits, businesses, and institutions, affirm the black LGBTQ people you serve 
and you employ. Take a look at your mission, your vision statement, your organizational structure, and your organizational culture. How are you spending your resources? And what, does, what do those things say about your commitment to diversity and inclusion? And lastly, for our community and political leaders, when you're doing work on behalf of the entire black community, seek out black LGBTQ leadership and invite us to your decision-making table. And as a cisgendered person in this LGBT community, if you invite me to your table and my transgender peers are not there, I will invite them myself. Or give up my seat if it means that we can learn from or be led by them and their initiatives in this movement. These are ways that we can all serve and show up for black people, for all black people in the movement. Thank you.